aren't coming and you're registered, if you aren't coming, you're gonna miss an amazing gathering, a, a very eclectic gathering of bright, brilliant, anointed, gifted people who work in ministry, marketplace, and mission fields and do it in the spirit of excellence. And you're always saying you wanna be mentored and when there's a chance to be mentored, you don't take it. This is your opportunity to be mentored to hear somebody tell how they got where they got and leave, let me tell you something, success leaves breadcrumbs. Yeah, why just wander into it when you can just follow the trail and get in the pathway and follow the footsteps of somebody else? It's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be easy as dreaming about it. Dreaming about it and being about it is two different things but I want you to register, sign up quickly and immediately to make sure that you get a seat in the house. We could have it here, but we had it downtown so you could be close to the hotels. If you go online and register online for hotels, maybe you've got a seat, but if you don't have a room, uh, the conference goes better when you're not sleeping in your car. So go on our website and get your hotel rooms as quickly as you can so that you can be a part of this extravaganza. It's going to be a unique experience and we want you to be included in it. Why don't you make it a gift to your pastor, to your leader, to your choir director, to your department head, to the people in your company, to the staff that you're trying to get to catch a vision that they don't seem to be able to catch. Why don't you make it a gift to them and sow something into them? I found out you can't get people to sow into you if you don't sow into them. Come on, come on, come on, talk to, talk to me somebody. Talk to me somebody. I want you to be a part of that and do not miss it. God has some great things in store for you. In the Gospel of St. Mark, Chapter number 15, verse 9 through 21. You will find my assignment this morning. There are many things that I want you to consider before I delve into this text. It's the globalness of God himself. A lot of times when we approach scriptures, we approach them either from a Judeo Old Testament understanding of scripture or a Christian New Testament understanding of scripture. And, but in our mind, we envision what we have seen. So we make the Bible American if we're from America. We make it from uh, a Spanish speaking country if we're from Spanish, from Spain. We make it African if we're from an African perspective. But the Bible is so knit that carefully studied and weaved, God has included all of us. It did not say that God so loved the church. It said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have as a possession right now. Not hope for but have eternal life. You, you think you're going to get eternal life. No, you you have eternal life. And, and the reason it said God so loved the world is because it also says it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he had to pay enough, die enough, bleed enough, suffer enough to be efficacious in his blood, enough to be inclusive, to invite the whole world into his experience. But because we learn about God through movies and television and Sunday school books, we have certain images of what occurred, but your image is not as broad as your God. Okay? Your God is broader than that. In, in the tapestry of his history, in the study of his lineage, he includes people of different backgrounds and ethnicities and types and different moral makeup and complexities. He includes Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess. I mean, Jesus claims these people as his great, 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 great ancestors. These people that some of you wouldn't eat with. 
we're in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So I want you to think globally, and I want to really focus into it. This Black History Month, but I want to focus into this understanding that this is not something that has been passed on to us. No, it has. It, it is not something that has been given to us through our understanding of history. We were always in the tapestry as well as everybody else. That's why we can have white folks and black folks and brown folks all dancing and shouting together because whether you are black, white, or brown, we're dancing about the red. Y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. We're dancing about the red, the red, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't a special blood for a special people. It was enough blood to save us all. So we are jumping into this at a, at, a, at a stress point, a stress point. We're jumping into this story at a time of great derision and adversity. Jesus has been passed from judgment hall to judgment hall. He has faced all kinds of adversity. He has been beaten with a cat of nine tails. He has been scourged, scourged sorely to the point that Isaiah says his entrails were hanging out. Not just back scarred and beaten, but his entrails would be his guts were peeking out through the lacerations in his skin. And in this state, this state of adversity, this state of debauchery, this state of decadence, this state of humiliation, he is paraded down the street in front of the crowd of people who were and were not interested in him at all. I do not want you to think that the 5,000 people who ate the fish and bread were there. I do not want you to think that the woman with the issue of blood was there. I do not want you to think that the 10 lepers were there. For the most part, Jerusalem was the place where they came to do business. It just so happened on this particular day, they came to do business at a time that the scourge, beaten, bloody, lacerated body of Jesus Christ has been put on Della Rosa on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem to carry a wooden cross on a bloody back. Now, Pilate is in a dilemma because he has to execute a sentence on Jesus that his wife has warned him in a dream might be to his detriment. So not willing as a politician to take responsibility for being the one who executed Jesus, he now brings Jesus out before the people and gives them the choice. Do you want Barabbas? or do you want Jesus? Because the priests knew that the people would get to make the decision, they had campaigned against Jesus. Okay, this is the underbelly of the text. Okay, are you ready? Let's go into it. But Pilate answered them saying, will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. So, so he's kind of jesting when he calls him the king of the Jews. He's making fun. When you're anointed, people will make. They, they, they will mock you. They will mock you. That's why you got to get your feelings out of people because you don't always get support from the place you sowed it. You, it is possible to sow it over here and reap it over there. But the chief priest moved the people that he should, that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. They're playing games. 
And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? Whom ye call, look at how he's modified it, whom ye call the king of the Jews. He had to be careful now because he does not want to offend Caesar because Jerusalem has become an outpost of Rome as Rome has taken over various territories, including the Middle East and uh, various parts of Northern Africa, the Roman Empire has grown. And they cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, why, what evil hath he done? And they couldn't answer that. So they cried out the more exceedingly, crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas, the thief, <laughs> unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him, beaten him, demanded that he be whipped to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away from the hall, called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. They clothed him with purple and planted a crown of thorns and put it about his head. Now nobody asked him to do that. They're just adding insult to injury. It's not because they adore him and began to salute him, hail, King of the Jews, be careful of people who say the right thing for the wrong reason. I'm preaching already. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him. And bowing their knees, they worshiped him, but not really. They, how many not really people do you have in your life who are going through the motions? Let me get back to this. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country the father, now, let me go back because I want, I want you to focus in. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. My subject this morning is selective service. Selective service. Now the people over 40, they're hollering amen because they know what selective service means. But I'm gonna make it plain for everybody. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on your word today and let it bring forth fruit in our lives. Open our minds and our thinking and our understanding that we might be able to behold your wondrous grace your splendiferous ability to step into our lives and do things that transcend human comprehension. The great God that you are, I trust you to have your way in this place. You are sovereign. You are Yahweh. You are omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient. Manifest your glory in this place. I ask you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> now the term selective service might not be familiar to you if you're a young person that's not a bad thing there's a lot of things that you all know about that we don't know about but we know about this selective service was noted on the top of what we call draft cards back when I was a young man teenager or so uh, everybody was issued a selective service card every male at a certain age because you were eligible to be drafted. Drafting was often the way that men entered into the Vietnam War. So we were born in war. There's, that's something you have to understand about boomers. 
we were born in war. We were born in conflict. We were not born in peace. When you are born in strife, you have a different kind of resilience and a different perspective because that was your normal. Not the strife, now you had wars too, but they didn't show you the bodies like they showed us. Do you remember the bodies? How they would show you, now they don't allow the media to cover the bodies coming off because America doesn't have the stomach for war. We talk about war from a budgetary perspective. We don't talk about war from the human capital that war costs, but we came up in a generation that the human capital was always in front of us. And so you had to have a certain resilience to stress because you were surrounded by that between civil rights and, 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 the, and the, the dogs biting and barking and the hoses turned on. That was the normative of the day. So we don't respond to trouble the way you understand because some of you were raised in peace. The draft, also known as conscription, has been used in the United States during several periods of history. This was not just common during the Vietnam War. It goes all the way back to the Civil War in 1863 to 1865 was when the draft was instituted. The draft meant whether you want to go or not. If you were drafted, you had to go. They reinstated it in World War I, and they reinstated it again in World War II from 1940 to 1947. They continued this method, and it's only in recent years that they have moved away from it. it all the way up through 1943, 1945, they continued down the same path of drafting people into the war. In fact, I believe shortly after the Vietnam War, they started moving away from that Technique At the top of your draft card, it would say selective service system. Selective service. You've been selected to serve. You've been chosen to serve. So you must understand while the draft has existed for about 20 years or so, it was interspersed between conflict. First there was, and then there wasn't. And then there was, and then there wasn't. In other words, you could be going about your daily life, doing your own business, going to school, taking classes, and all of a sudden get a selective, card, selective service card and you have been drafted. Uh, I, 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 it's a funny thing, but, but it's true anyhow. We have to understand that this was the way that they kept the army base full because we were more uh, proficient at human capital and war on the ground than we were airstrikes. We had the Navy by water, we had the aircraft, but a lot of wars were fought on the ground, okay? One of the reasons that we have so much population in the world today is that we have less conflict. Less conflict means more people. More people means more crowds. More crowds means more housing. More housing means more jobs. And so some of the benefits of us becoming a little more civilized, not civilized, but a little more civilized has resulted in having more people. So we get to have kitty problems. We, we, we argue about things that we didn't get to argue about in the 60s because we had bigger problems. Small arguments are for people who don't have big problems. Have you ever had a problem and then another problem came along and made the other problem seem irrelevant? You, 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 you were worried to death because you were behind on your mortgage and then you found out that your spouse had cancer? And all of a sudden you said, I don't care about the mortgage, I don't care where we stay, I don't care where we live, because real trouble will make you recalibrate what a problem is. Now the people who are clapping are people who had real trouble. Real trouble will come into your life, you get a call and say your mama's dead, and all of a sudden it doesn't matter that your wife is overweight. <laughs> Y'all just had a big argument. I know you're not going to eat a Frosty.
I bought you a treadmill for Christmas. There you are slurping up an old frosty on me and then you get a text and say your mama passed away and now you got a frosty. <laughs> now, I escaped the draft. I was not a draft dodger. It just that so happened that by the time I became eligible to be drafted, they had cut the draft off and I didn't have to go through that. But my brother went through the draft, okay? He went through the process. He didn't go to war, didn't go to battle because uh, he, for health reasons, he was rejected from having to fight, but he had a selective service card. And the reason I remember it so well is because I used to borrow it. Well, don't judge me. <laughs> I'm seven years younger than him, but I, I grew fast. So I, when I was 13, I was about six feet tall at, at 13, but I, I looked old enough to be drafted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had my brother down the house the other day and, and, uh, and he took a picture, put it up on the screen. He, he took a picture posing, yeah, yeah. That's my one and only brother in the world, Ernest. I'm, I hope he's not watching right now because I'm not sure that he knows that I used to take his selective service card. I'm not sure, we never really talked about it, but I borrowed it a few times to get into places that I shouldn't have got into. <laughs> to buy things that I wasn't supposed to buy and do things I wasn't supposed to do. They say, are you old enough? I whip out the selective service card. And I was as tall as he was then. And so I fit the description. I had the profile, but I, 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 was, I was not of age. Selective service, drafted, drafted, drafted. Drafted is, is a term that we use in the country, in the streets. Uh, selective service is what we use in the government. In, from a theological perspective, we would use a term called chosen. To be chosen is to be drafted. Yeah. means I didn't ask for it. I wasn't seeking it. This is not an answer to prayer. I have been selected. <laughs> I have been chosen. I have been chosen. And when, when we think about chosen, it sounds so good, it's easy to preach about. I am chosen, I am the Lord's chosen. It sounds real good and pompous. It sounds just as prestigious as, as the scarlet robe they put on Jesus and called him king of the Jews. But in reality, chosen is not always fun. The reality is many times in the Bible when you were chosen, you were chosen for struggle, for strife, for resistance, for obstacles. And while it was difficult to be chosen, it also was a compliment that God thought you were worthy enough to choose you. Somebody say, I have been chosen. chosen. Now, nah, yeah, yeah, you didn't say it with much luster. <laughs> yeah, I understand, that's okay, that's okay. I'm not gonna have you say it over. Yeah, yeah, I have been chosen. A lot of the things that we are praying against, we have been chosen to deal with. Let me prove this chosen thing. Jesus says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I know it was you that walked up the aisle with tears running down your face and you knelt at the altar and you gave your life to Christ, but the only reason you had the tears running down your face is because I convicted you, I chose you, I drew you, I pulled you, and now you say you chose me, but in reality, I chose you. God chooses people. 
He doesn't get them to vote. He doesn't get them to, he, he doesn't get them to have a say in the matter. He just simply chooses them to play certain roles in life at a particular time. And he doesn't always announce to you that you are chosen. For example, with Jeremiah, who was trying to resist the call, Jesus, the Bible said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, I ordained thee, and I sanctified thee. You don't get no choice in this. You gonna be a prophet. You're, you're, you're going to be a prophet to the nations, and you shall go to all that I shall send you. Say not that you cannot go, that you are a child, because I have chosen you. There are people in this room that don't understand their lives because you find yourself in a situation that you didn't pick, that you didn't want, that you didn't choose, that you didn't desire, that you didn't pray for. You was praying for something way over here and God put you way over here and, 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 and you don't understand why. Look, for example, the Bible said when the sons of God came around the throne among them also came Lucifer and, G and God said to him, where have you been? He said, I've been going to and fro and up and down throughout the earth seeking whom I may devour. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> and you know how that story went. Have you considered my servant Job? He said, you know I can't do anything with Job because you've got a hedge all around it. Glory to God. That's why people who aren't going through shouldn't talk about people who are going through. <laughs> Because the only reason you're not going through is that God has a hedge all around you. Satan says, if you remove the hedge from around him, I will make him curse you to your face. And God said, I will move the hedge from around everything, but from around his soul. Now, now you can attack him, but it's his decision how he responds to the attack. Job is a righteous and an upright man. Just because you're righteous and upright doesn't mean you don't go through trouble, but it does mean that you get to choose how you respond to the trouble that you're in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Or Joseph was chosen. He didn't ask his father Jacob to make a coat of many colors and to put it on him, but the father made a coat of many colors and put it on him and it was thrust upon him. He didn't even know to hide that he was chosen. He told his brothers that he had a dream and told them his dream and expected them to be glad. This is the funny part for me because sometimes God can bless you and you can expect people to be glad for you. And the very people that you told thinking they would be glad for you secretly despise you because they are envious of the choice whereby you have been chosen. I just need 10 witnesses if I could get 10 witnesses. Joseph was chosen. He was chosen. He was chosen. He was actually chosen ultimately to be the prince of Egypt. But in between, he gets thrown into a pit. <laughs> he gets lied on at Potiphar's house. He gets cast into jail. Isn't it amazing how much stuff can get in the way of your destiny, in between you and your destiny? Can you imagine Joseph sitting in the pit at the bottom of a well, in a, in a dry well, and they're lying on him and saying that he is dead, and they have taken the coat of many colors that he was so proud of and smeared it with blood and brought it back as evidence that he was dead. And Joseph said, how can I be faithful? favored and be in this condition. There are some of you that are going through some things right now that you say, how can I be favored and be going through what I'm going through? You don't understand that this is just a step in the process of God moving you into the place that he's got to move you to show forth glory in your life. And he showed you the coat, but he didn't show you the pit. He showed you the palace, but he didn't show you Potiphar's house. He showed you you would be exalted, but he didn't show you you'd be fired first. He showed you in a big house, but he didn't show you you were going to be homeless first. But you have been chosen. Talk back to me and say, I've been chosen. David was chosen. 
David was chosen of God. He was chosen by Samuel to be the king of Israel and Samuel had anointed him with oil, preparing him to be king, but sending him back to take care of sheep. Can you be great and still do menial tasks? Part of his testing was, can you be anointed to be king and go back and shovel sheep dung? This is a test of your character. This is a test of your humility. This is a test of your patience. Timing is everything. The vision is for an appointed time. In the end, it will speak and not lie. God may not give you the details, but when it's all over, everything's gonna be all right because you have been chosen. You have been chosen to be a delivery boy, a, 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 a Uber driver, Uber Eats driver. Jo David did not know when he went down to the field to bring lunch to his brothers who were enlisted in the service that this was going to be the moment in his life that he was chosen. All he knew was when he got down there with the lunch, he ran into an incident that he was not expecting and that incident defined the fact that he was chosen. You, you know you're chosen by the level of trouble. If, if a kitty cat scratches you, you might not be chosen. But if a lion comes after you, it's a sign you're chosen. The devil wouldn't attack you like he's attacking you if he didn't have something awesome to do in your life. David did not wake up that morning and said, I feel like fighting a giant. I feel like fighting a giant. I feel like taking my slingshot and going down there and running out in the field and seeing, telling a giant, what do you have? No, David was packing lunch to bring food to his brethren who were in a fight. It wasn't even his fight. I want to talk to some people that are fighting things that aren't even your fight. You just got drafted. You just married into a fight. <laughs> you just got hired into a fight. You stepped into a situation. Here you are just a whistling and skipping and going down there to bring them some lunch so they can get something to eat, never knowing that this is the day that you're going to have to use your weapons in a way you never had to use them before because you have been chosen for a fight. Nobody could beat Goliath but David. None of Saul's army could beat Goliath but David. Nobody could defeat him, not with swords, not with chariots, not with fire, not with any kind of weaponry, but David could defeat him because because he was chosen. Look at somebody say, I'm chosen. Yeah, you're getting a little bit better with it now. You're getting a little bit better with it. It's coming on. I'm chosen for this fight. I'm chosen for this giant. I'm chosen for this person. I'm chosen to raise this child. I'm chosen to do this job. I'm chosen to function in this office. The, the safest place for me to be is in the will of God. I'm in the right place at the right time doing the right thing and I don't have to find my giant. My giant will find me. I think that David should send Goliath roses because Goliath put David on the map. If Goliath had not been there, Saul would not have noticed him. He would have never been invited into the palace. But sometimes God allows you to go through trouble because trouble becomes a stage that he places you on to show your resilience, your strength, your tenacity, your power. I'm talking to somebody, I don't know who it is, but holler at your boy and say, I'm chosen. When the mother packed the lunch for the little boy in case he got hungry, since he was going to hear this Reverend Jesus preach down uh, in the desert, she packed two fish and five loaves of bread, and the boy's carrying a greasy bag with two fish, catfish probably, in it, and met, might have been cornbread, I don't know. And he's going down there with some catfish and some cornbread. He did not 
expect to have to give up his lunch. He expected to eat his lunch, but the little boy didn't know he was chosen. He didn't ask for it. He didn't seek it. He didn't pack it and say, I'm going to give away my lunch. He just found himself in a situation. I want to preach to some people who have found yourself in a situation. You don't even know how you got there yourself. And the disciples up there saying, uh, we got to send the 5,000 men away, not to mention the women and children, because we don't have enough food to have. Jesus said, what do you have? They said, all we have is two fish and five loaves of bread. Excuse me, all you have is two fish and five loaves of bread? I don't get to vote in this. This is my lunch. You ain't got nothing. But people will count your gift as their gift when they, oh, oh y'all don't hear what I'm saying. When they need you, they will pull you in there and, and, and use their accounting and count it as if it was there. And here the boy who had a lunch ends up with no lunch so that the people who had no lunch could get to eat. Now he got to go get in line and sit down and wait for them to count in groups of 50 only to get back what he already had in the first place. Sometimes when you're chosen, it's not right, it's not fair, it's not just, it's not true, but God has selected you to serve in an unjust situation and you gotta be strong enough to give up your lunch, to know that if you're so it oh my god I felt the anointing on that if you sow it you're going to reap it back somebody holler at me just a minute the disciples were chosen not one of the disciples just walked up to Jesus and said hey I'm looking for a job and I was thinking about being on your staff and being in your committee. Jesus chose all 12 of them, including Judas. He drafted it, I don't care what you're doing. Put your nets down. Come on and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about what life will do to you. I'm talking about messing up your plans and messing up where you thought you'd be. There are some people in this room that wouldn't have dreamed in a thousand years that you'd be sitting where you're sitting right now. But when God has chosen you, he orders your steps in such a way that he'll bring you to a place you thought you'd never be. Am I preaching in the right place or what? Jesus was chosen. Father, if it be thy will, pass this bitter cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I have been chosen to stand before the Sanhedrin court. I have been chosen to be ostracized by the Pharisees and Sadducees that have mocked me all my life. I have been chosen to be beaten with a cat of nine tails until my intestines are peeking out through the skin of my stomach. I have been chosen to be publicly humiliated in front of my disciples and my friends and my mother. I have been chosen to be ostracized, nearly faint from the loss of blood because the enemy tried to beat the blood out of him because he couldn't break the curse till he got to the cross. So the blood that fell on the ground didn't count. He had to go to the cross to redeem the world. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Now we know it was God's design. Can I take my time? We, we know it was God's design, but I also want you to see that God can order something in heaven and you can still get set up on earth. Caiaphas, the priest, got together with Pilate and worked out a deal that led to Jesus' demise. It was the plot of the priest to put Jesus into this position. They had infiltrated public opinion.
and control public opinion so that when Pilate would ask, who do you want, Barabbas or Jesus, the Jesus who healed the sick and raise the dead and turn water into wine. The Jesus that they many thought was the Messiah and would be their king, they rejected him. The Bible prophesied it. He came unto his own and his own received him not. They rejected him. It was a setup. But every setup is an opportunity for God to stand up and show himself strong in the lives of his people. Now to our text. <laughs> we catch a stumbling Jesus, not a standing Jesus, a stumbling bent over, broken down, bowed over Jesus, not a walking water Jesus not a resurrected Jesus, but a bleeding, wounded, suffering Jesus. The same Jesus who healed the woman with the issue of blood is now bleeding profusely himself. And there is nobody to staunch the bleeding. The bloody path that leads to purpose is stained with sacrifice. It does not come because you want it. He stained the streets of Delarosa with his own blood. He who stopped bleeding did not stop his own bleeding. Sometimes you can help other people out of things you can't get yourself out of. Can I get a witness in here? I'm, I'm talking to selective service. People have been chosen. And, and now he's in this scene and they, it, it would have been enough that they put a crown of thorns on his head. It would have been enough that they put the, the robe on him and called him the king of the Jews. It would have been enough that they beat him almost to death till his guts were hanging out. And Isaiah said there was no beauty about him that we should desire him. He does not look good in this moment. There's somebody I want to preach to you don't look good in this moment. This is not a good season. It's not a good period in your marriage. It's not a good stage in your life. It's not a good stage in your career. It's not a good stage in your home life. It's not a good stage between you and your daughter. It's not a good stage between you and your son. He's looking bad and he's trying to make the best of a bad situation and he's stumbling a stumbling Jesus we've seen a standing Jesus we've seen a sitting Jesus we've seen a sleeping Jesus but now we see a stumbling Jesus he does not look omnipotent he does not look omnipresent he does not look omniscient he looks weak and frail and broken and tattered and torn but man looks looks on the outer appearance. God looks on the heart. I just want you to understand if you're a stumbling son, he understands you because he is a stumbling Jesus. And the Roman soldiers who got tired of making fun of him said, let's hurry up. Simon, Simon, come help him. Simon of Cyrene, come help him with the cross. Now, I, I, got, I'm, I, I need a little time. Can I have it? Okay. Now, now, in all of the synoptic gospels, they refer to Simon as Simon of Cyrene. Okay. But Mark is the only one that refers to him and his children. Everybody else, Matthew, Luke, referred to him as if he were a stranger on the side of the road. Most commentaries talk about Simon as if he were a stranger on the side of the road. But when Mark talks about him, he talks about him from a place of familiarity. He says, Simon of Cyrene, and his two sons, and he names his sons, which says to me, Mark knew Simon. Mark knew Simon. You don't, 
look at a person and name them and their kids if you don't know the person. So Simon is not here by accident. Simon is here by providence. Simon is here on purpose. Incidentally, Cyrene was in the northern parts of Africa. He is here at this particular point, at this particular time. He is there. And at the moment that Christianity is being established, this black man from Africa had been planted in this spot. And Mark knows who he is and he even knows his children. So it is not true that Simon has just showed up on the scene as if he were bartering to do business. This is a setup. This is an assignment. Simon has been chosen to play this role in history. This is an intervention where this dark man from Africa comes in to lift the weight of a cross that he would never die on, but he was there to lift the weight. Is there anybody here to lift some weight off of somebody? That's your call. That's your mission. That's your anointing. That's your gifting. You've got the capacity to lift the weight. It ain't even my cross. It's not my cross. But I've been drafted to carry it. And so I'm boggling in my mind trying to figure out how does Mark no Simon of Cyrene. And then I begin to realize and understand, first of all, Mark is not one of the apostles. He's an evangelist. He writes the gospel, but he is not listed as one of the 12 apostles. He is Mark the evangelist. Second of all, Mark comes from Cyrene. Why didn't anybody tell us that Mark is African? Why didn't they tell us that Mark knew Simon and his children? That Mark had been raised in Cyrene and had gone into Jerusalem and had been trained in Rome, but he had not forgotten his roots. Why didn't they tell us that this was a setup? That Simon would be selected to help Jesus carry the cross. We, 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 don't, we, we, we don't hear this kind of conversation because it was not beneficial for us to understand that our face was in the text. So I read it in the African Bible and I started studying it in the African Bible and then I started verifying it through other sources that we had a very prominent place. According to the African Study Bible, we had a very prominent role to play that we were not told. We were not told that Augustine comes from Northern Africa that Augustine, who is responsible for fighting for the doctrine that would become the Nicene Creed, was from Africa. We were not shown to be there lifting weight. But are we not weightlifters? Have we not always been weightlifters? Oh, I don't have time. I can't do it justice, Jesus. When, when Moses had to flee out of Egypt and he had to flee into the desert and he comes to a place where he runs into Jethro who was called burnt face. Jethro 
who lived in the desert? Did not Jethro lift the weight of Moses' pain up off of him and taught him how to survive in the desert? Because once you've been in a desert, you are there not to replace anybody, but I can tell you how to get through a desert because I was raised in a desert. I was raised in trouble. I can tell you how to take $10 and feed five kids because I've been in the desert. I can tell you how to make it with your lights off and your water off. I can tell you how to do that. I can tell you how to do it because I was raised in what you're going through. And your job is your job and my job is my job. But God has me on assignment to lift the weight up off of you that I can tell you weeping may endure for a night but joy is coming in the morning. I want to talk to every depressed, broken, wounded, hurting person in this room that you might be weeping right now, but they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. How do you know? I cried myself. I suffered myself. I agonized myself. There's something that you get from the tears that makes you able to receive the blessing. Stop trying to take shortcuts to get to success. There's a reason you've been afflicted. There's a reason you've been ostracized. There's a reason you've been overlooked. God is training you to make you tough enough so that when you get there, having done all the stand, Having done all the stand, you'll stand with your loins girt about with truth. I feel like preaching this morning. I'm talking to somebody in this place this morning. Somebody giving 30 seconds of crazy praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Away with this idea that Christianity is the white man's religion. The devil is a lie. Christianity is man's religion. It's for everybody. All colors, all people can find their face in the Bible. You belong where you are. Touch somebody and say, you belong where you are. You didn't ask for it, you didn't seek it, you didn't desire it, it's not what you had in mind, but God has chosen you to play a particular role at a particular time, and I want you to stop crying about it and complaining about it and fussing about it and start giving God praise about it right now. Somebody, whoever I'm preaching to, you may be in the balcony, you may be all the way in the back, but whoever I'm preaching to in this place, God's got you right where he wants you. We are always preaching about Simon Peter, but hardly ever preach about Simon of Cyrene. These two Cyrenian men, we never acknowledge that they came out of Africa. It's not a big deal until you don't acknowledge it. It's not a big deal that the Ethiopian eunuch came from and went back to Ethiopia until you don't acknowledge it. It's not a big deal that the Queen of Sheba comes out of Ethiopia and that, and that, and that, and that, and that Solomon didn't make her rich. She was rich when she got there. And it's not just that she was black, she was a woman and she was rich and in authority and in a position of power and there was no liberation movement. She was already walking in power. It's not a big deal until you don't mention it. So I hurried to my close. So the question arises, can you serve unmentioned? <laughs> Can
Can you, can, can, can you serve unnoticed? Can you love overlooked? Can you serve and people never call your name? Can you be the other Simon? The other Simon. The other. The other that she kekande. The other Simon, I feel my Pentecostal roots standing up in me right now. I know what it is to be the other Simon. I know what it is to be overlooked. I know what it is to be pushed aside. The first time I came to Azusa, they almost knocked me down trying to get the best seats. I ended up in the balcony in the nosebleed section in the furthest seat all the way at the top because I was not Simon. I was the other Simon, I came to talk to some people. Everybody's overlooking you, but God has a plan for your life and a plan for your future and a plan for your destiny. And don't be afraid because it is not merely serendipitous. God has a plan for your life that he has chosen you to play a role in history that may not always feel good, that may put a weight on you that you didn't expect to have. Yes, Lord, I haven't forgotten. I'm going to get it. That you have been chosen to raise that child. No, not, 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 the, not the good one. The, the one that gets your last nerve and drives you crazy and anybody else would have hit them in the head with a skillet but there's an anointing on your life to play that role that nobody else could play. Could it be possible that you have been chosen to be married to somebody that other people wouldn't be able to stand, but there's a grace on you, there's a gift on you, there's an anointing on you, there's a power on you, and your mama couldn't take it, and your sister couldn't take it, but God has chosen you to lift up the cross and carry a weight. I want to find Simon, 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 are you? in this room? Is there a Simon in the room? I don't care what gender you are. I don't care what color you are. Before life is over, all of us get an opportunity to carry something we didn't ask for. To carry something that we don't want to carry. To lift up a cross that's not even our own. All of us will get a turn to be spat on. To be treated without dignity. All of us will be a footnote in somebody's story. Simon of Cyrene. If it were not for Mark, we wouldn't even know this dude was a person that mattered, that had a family and a life and a history, and that he had been drafted when things were at their worst to walk with a stumbling Jesus. Peter walked with an erect Jesus, a strong Jesus, a water walking Jesus. But Simon of Cyrene was chosen to walk with a stumbling Jesus. I submit to you in this age, as Christianity stumbles, and many have judged it irrelevant, and the number of church-going Christians is declining. Could it be possible? Could it be possible? Could it be possible that God has chosen you to lift up the weight of the cross in this season? Let me go deeper. That thing that you want to get out from under. That thing that you want to quit that ain't even fair. That 
thing where you get no credit and no acknowledgement and you don't even feel appreciated That thing that you didn't ask for? You didn't sign up for this stuff. I can hear your prayer going up to God. You told God, I didn't sign up for this. No, you got drafted. Because he knew you were strong enough to stand up under the load of something that would have crushed anybody else. And you're the only one holding the thing together. You're holding the family together. You're holding yourself together. You're holding the kids together. You're holding your spouse together. It's not fair. You're not treated right. You don't always feel appreciated. Where are you? I'm talking to somebody. Wave at me if I'm talking to you. You have been chosen to play a role that nobody else in history could play but you. And sometimes you have been chosen to be attacked. You have been picked out to be picked on. You have been set aside for such a time as this. And you'll go through a season that it doesn't seem just and it doesn't seem fair and it doesn't seem right but God has chosen you to bring down a giant that nobody else could bring down but you. To stand up to a test that nobody else could stand up to but you. That nobody could witness in the hospital and have breast cancer and still be a witness to the nurse while the nurse is treating your sore. It could be possible that God has set you in a situation that you absolutely hate but God has drafted you because he knew that even with your feelings hurt and tears running down your face and your body racked with pain, he knew you'd still bear up the weight of it all. As I come to the close of this message, and I'm not closing, I'm just quitting because it's polite. I want to talk to people who were kind of crazy like me. I, I, thought it, I thought life would be fair. I thought if you did good things, you'd be appreciated. I thought if you did your job, you'd be acknowledged. I thought, I, I thought if you helped people, they'd help you back. I want to talk to somebody right now who has been chosen selected to serve in the midst of pain. And when nobody's looking, you cry yourself to sleep. And when nobody's looking, you want to quit. And you have threatened to walk away a thousand times. But walk away is not in you. And you're here today and I'm preaching this message for you to tell you that God knows who you are and God knows what's going to come out of you and the reason your children are named is because you're going to break generational curses. I am here to tell you that God will always leave somebody around who understands what you've been through and where you came from and the pain you bear. And I am here to tell you for every Simon there is a mark. I know it's no mistake that you're here, that God has drafted you for this assignment and nobody can do what you do like you do it because you have been born for such a time as this. In Israel, it's a requirement that if you go to school, you have to be trained for military. You're born to fight. You have to fight. In Ukraine, they started drafting men. Didn't ask you, do you want to fight? They said, if you're a man and you're of a certain age, you got to fight. Life does not ask you how you feel about the fight.
you got to pull your big girl pants up and stand up to the fight. Who am I preaching to? Make some noise in here. I chose you, I chose you, I chose you, I chose you, I chose you. I chose you to raise that child with that learning disability, with that behavioral problem, with that temperament, with that attitude. I put something inside of you that you are the only one that can get through to that person and don't you stop believing in yourself because God sent me here to preach to Simon. I don't want Simon Peter to come to the altar. You get enough credit. You walked on water. You caught masses of fish. You preached on the day of Pentecost. You get enough credit. Your shadow falls on people and they get healed. I didn't come to preach to Simon Peter. I came to preach to Simon of Serene, who has been placed at a particular place at a particular time to play a part in history and seldom gets mentioned at all. Simon of Serene, whether you are black, white, or brown, this is bigger than that, whether you are male or female, if you are carrying a cross you didn't ask for, I want you on this altar. If you are carrying a cross you didn't seek, if you just came down here to bring some lunch to your brothers and now you're standing in front of Goliath and he's trying to kill you and you having to fight big stuff that wasn't even your stuff. If you're watching online, I'm talking to you. The anointing of God is in this place. The spirit of God is in this place. God is speaking right to your situation. He is answering your prayer. You thought it was going to be fair, didn't you? You thought it was going to be right. You thought it was going to be just. God moved you, Simon, to be at the right place at the right time because you have the anointing to lift a weight that would have crushed somebody else.